Greetings, everyone. This is Jeff Wilkerson, Professor of Physics, bringing you the next in our series of what to look for in the night sky. We're talking about the week of November 4th this time around. So uh, let's start. Uh, let's look at the planets we've been, been looking at here. Then we'll talk about where the moon is and think about a couple of other things. Uh, so Saturn is on the meridian, the line that connects north to south at about 8 p.m. So you go out about 8 p.m. now and you look straight south. And Saturn will be the, the bright object that's kind of yellowish in that direction. So that's a great great chance to see Saturn. The moon's going to meet up with it later in the week. So we'll, we'll catch back up with Saturn. Jupiter will be on the meridian at about 2 a.m. What that means is when you're looking at Saturn on the, that north-south line, looking due south, if, if, if you live north, uh, looking due south to see Saturn there, then Jupiter will be the big, bright, whitish object that's rising in the east. So you see Jupiter coming up. You got Jupiter and Saturn in the sky there together. A couple hours after Jupiter rises, uh, Mars will join them. And we talked about uh, some open star clusters last week. Go back and watch that again if you want to. One of the clusters we talked about was the Beehive star cluster in the heart of Cancer. And Mars is moving toward the Beehive cluster right now. It's in prograde motion. It's still moving in normal forward motion in, uh, against, which is eastward against the background stars. And it's moving right toward the Beehive cluster. And it's gonna be fun to watch. So if you got your binoculars and you see the Beehive cluster, again, the Beehive cluster is bright enough. Uh, if you got dark skies, you can see it without binoculars. But you can see Mars closing in, closing in on it, but it's slowing down. And it's slowing down as we catch up and pass it. And it's about to go into retrograde motion, but it's not going to do that for a while. Uh, we got all the way into December. So we got a, a more than a month, five, six weeks of Mars closing down. It's going to get right to the beehive. So we'll be tracking this. It's going to be great. Mars is going to get right to the beehive cluster, and then it's going to turn around and start back east. And those retrograde loops, they're called, where a, a planet goes up, it stops eastward motion, turns around and goes back to the west for a while as we catch up and pass it in our orbit, and then it turns around and goes back east like that. Those retrograde loops were key to our understanding of the, the solar system and the structure of how things worked. It was key to understanding that we live in a heliocentric solar system, and Johannes Kepler, uh, so Tycho Brahe measured these, these retrograde loops and measured these retrograde loops. There's Tycho Brahe. Uh, so he measured for 20 plus years, he measured these retrograde loops there. And, and Johannes Kepler used that data to then make a model of what orbits must look like around the sun and deduce that the orbits of the planets are actually elliptical and not circular, which is what everybody had thought. That of. And it was all about understanding the motions of the planets and the motions of those planets, those retrograde loops as we caught up and passed were really key. Uh, it was really hard. For, for centuries, for millennia prior to that, people struggled to understand the motions of the planets because <clears throat> uh, of those retrograde loops. Like, what you could, you could come up with all kinds of models. If everything just moved uniformly and smoothly in one direction, you could come up with all kinds of models, uh, relatively simple models that would work. But, but these things that, that, that behave awkwardly by slowing down and stopping and going backward and then going forward again, that threw, that threw a wrench into everything trying to figure this out. And so this was a great mystery uh, that, that drove us forward in the way we thought about what, what the solar system was like and then how the universe works beyond that. So all that's coming up, all that you can think about as you watch Mars close on the Beehive Cluster, just get almost to it and turn around and head back as we get late into December. Uh, so it's going to be fun. Uh, Okay, back to this week. Enough of that. Back to this week, right? Uh, on the 4th, the first evening of the week that we're talking about, the moon will be about 10% full, and it'll be sitting just below Venus, about 4 degrees, about 4 moon diameters below Venus in the evening sky. So it goes out just after sunset. You see the glow in the west. You see Venus shining brightly, big, bright Venus there. There's the moon right below it. Great. One night later, uh, the the on the 5th, the evening of the 5th, the moon will have filled out to be about 15 to 20 percent full, full, still a beautiful crescent moon, and it'll, it'll nip right by, well that's a terrible rendering of the teapot of Sagittarius, but the teapot of Sagittarius is there, there's the handle, the upper right star in the corner of the body of the teapot, Chaos Medea, is a 2.7 magnitude star, easy bright star to see for most of us. If we have any kinds of dark skies at all, the moon's going to slide really close to it, going to slide right by it on that next night, the 5th. Now, I'll jump ahead four nights to the 9th, and the moon's already 60% full. It's approaching two-thirds full, and it'll be just over two-thirds full the next night. On the evening of the 9th, the moon 
sits a few degrees away from Deneb al a third magnitude star, the tail of the goat is what that is. We've talked about it quite a bit because it's, it's in the, the plane of the solar system, so planetary objects, solar system objects pass by there uh, all the time. A night later on the 10th, the moon will have caught Saturn, and so the moon will be about two-thirds full, a little more than two-thirds full, will be sitting just underneath Saturn. Uh, that's that. By the time it's two-thirds full, it's up most of the night. So if you're not out in the evening to watch it, you can watch it after midnight into the morning of the 11th as well. So that's going to be something to see. Uh, if, you're gonna, you know, if you want to check any of this out, check out the pairing with Venus early in the week and the pairing with Saturn late in the week. It's going to be great. Now, if we think back to Venus, above Venus in the evening sky, as it gets dark, is the Summer Triangle. And you've heard me talk about this before, uh, that the Summer Triangle is... Um, it's great, okay, and because you can see it year-round. We call it the Summer Triangle, but right now, there it is hanging to the west. Uh, and so we want to look out there. We see big, bright Vega, big, bright Deneb, and big, bright Altair making this triangle that's hanging above Venus and maybe a little bit east of Venus. Also, on the night of the 4th, when the moon is there with Venus, we have our southern torrid meteor shower. And our southern torrid meteor shower, is, so we name the meteor showers for where the radiant is, where the meteors look like they're coming from, where they're originating, and what constellation, and this is Taurus. But we have two of these, two streams of, of, of particles that we pass through, and one is to the south, and one is a little bit to the north, and so we have the southern torrids, and then about a week later, we can talk about it next week, we'll have the northern torrids, although there'll be a lot of moon by that point. Uh, the southern torrids, uh, it's a big, broad, big, broad tube of stuff. We've talked about this before, too, is that you get a lot of stuff, and, and it takes a while to pass through it. So we've been having southern torrid meteors for a, a while now, a couple of months, uh, or a month and a half, maybe. And, and so this is material that's left over from uh, 2P Inky is the comet that this is left over from. And it's only going to produce about five meteors per hour, uh, which is about what, uh, about what you would see otherwise from random meteors of other stuff that aren't associated with a shower. So you might see twice as many meteors as you would on a normal, uh, on an average night, on a typical night. And so uh, these southern towers, but they look like they're coming from the constellation towers. Be sure to check that out. But also you're checking out, of, uh, you're using Venus, you're looking above Venus, but any night that you're looking above Venus, you can see the summer triangle. Now, Altair, the southernmost star in the summer triangle, looks like it sits as part of a diamond, as the top part of a diamond, or a kite, and the tail of the kite comes down this way. And that star, Lambda, so you have the big, bright Vega, Deneb, and Altair. Lambda is a 3.4 magnitude star. Good skies, should be able to see it uh, without optical aid. Next to Lambda is 12 Aquila, and that's a fourth magnitude star. Really good skies. Many of us can see that too, especially earlier in the week when we don't have a lot of moonlight. Uh, they're washing stuff out. And next to it is Eta. And Eta, so you come down the tail and you just drop three stars over like that. You go to a fourth magnitude and a 4.8 magnitude star. Now that's getting on the edge of what we're able to see. Uh, we should be able to see it, but you're going to have to have some pretty good skies to be able to see it. Now, just below there, is probably what I think is the best open star cluster that there is to observe, M11. Look at it in binoculars. If you've got a small telescope, it's just fabulous in a small telescope, is M11. And three degrees below there is another open star cluster, M26. And we looked at open star clusters last week, uh, these clusters that live in the plane of our galaxy. But M11 and M26 are great examples here. And we can use the summer triangle. We can, we can marvel at the summer triangle still being high in the sky. Now just watch it as we're watching Mars close in on the beehive as we work our way into and through December. We can watch the summer triangle and see it uh, sinking on the western horizon as we get to the end of the year. And we can use, for, right now, we can use Aquila. That's going to get harder as we have the weeks going forward to drop our way down to Lambda, 12 and Eta Aquila, uh, these fainter stars down here which sit right above M11 and M26, two really good open star clusters, but I'm particularly a fan of M11. If you're gonna, gonna, if you're gonna see one open star cluster this year, make it M11. Um, and, if, and, and, and if you're gonna see one moon pairing, uh, you've got a lot of good moon pairings, but the moon pairing with Saturn will be great this week. So we got a lot of good stuff. We always, you know what, it always turns out that every week is the best week ever for getting out there and observing the sky. we got a lot of good stuff to see, and I hope you have a great week of observing ahead, and as always, thanks for watching, everybody.